medical and mental things can become more of an issue because the conditions don't support the health of someone, right? So we've seen that a lot during COVID where people were like, I never had a mental health issue and now I have anxiety or I have PTSD or I'm bipolar or I'm this and I'm that. As a child, I don't remember having mental health issues or illnesses, but that might be because I barely remember my childhood. My personal struggle with mental health began to unravel further after I gave birth to my first child. The postpartum journey brought me anxiety, depression, a stuttering problem, and seemingly new episodes with high highs and low lows. You're listening to Black, Bipolar, and Disordered, a podcast uncovering the realities of living with bipolar disorder as a Black person in the United States of America. Today, we're connecting with Savia Wade to discuss the intersections of Black maternal health and Black mental health. Sabia Wade is a Black queer doula of nearly 10 years. Her work is liberation-centered, meaning that she centers around supporting marginalized communities in the reproductive justice space, from the exciting positive pregnancy test to arduous labor and beyond. Sabia understands the intersections of mental health in pregnancy and how that can lead to disparities in birth and postpartum success. In my experience, I've had people that had, you know, mental health diagnosis before, but more so after having a, a baby in their postpartum stage, you don't know until you have to deal with another in, another person. And you're like, oh, I thought this was normal. And I think a lot of times, like when we talk about bipolar disorder, borderline personality, personality disorder, depression, anxiety, we also have a fear as Black people is coming off as angry. Even in our own cultures, right? Like, oh, this person is the weird one or they're the angry one or they're the, you know, they're always fighting. And you're like, maybe this is like sign of mental health. But then even in our education systems as children, right? Like in Push Out, um, Monique talks about Black girls specifically, as soon as they enter the, the school system, they're now moving into the school to prison pipeline. They're getting criminalized at the age of five. Right. So if you have ADHD as a, a black little girl, or if you have depression or anxiety or whatever the situation is, like from from that age, we're kind of taught to to mask and to and to fall in line. And when we have children, there's something about that process that is so you can't mask. There there's there is no masking anymore. <laughs> like there is no covering the symptoms. There is no Right. There's like a rawness with with birth and, and babies. And, you know, then on top of it, you're dealing with the maternal disparities that you're being told, like, you might die. It's a really high chance that you may die for no other reason than you're Black. Put it all together. And we have this beautiful mix of undiagnosed and sometimes diagnosed. But why isn't it diagnosed? Black people specifically are scared to interact with a system that might move them into the, ch the child protective services system, right? So what if I do express that I have thoughts of harming myself? What if I do express that I have intrusive thoughts about harming my kid? What if I do express that I'm really sad and I just let my baby cry for hours, right? Does that make me a bad parent? Am I now going to be policed? Am I now going to be, right? Like, there's so many elements that come into kind of where we are and how it impacts Black people. Needless to say, she has been an excellent companion for many birthing people and postpartum experiences. Savia, thank you so much for joining the show. Tell me a little bit about your role as a doula working with Black birthing people and more. As a doula, my role is to be a support person, right? A non-medical support person. So I'm not doing the midwifery piece, like doing vaginal exams and things like that, right? What would you say, as someone who supports the postpartum stage as well, what emotional states do many postpartum mothers go through? Yeah, I think that there's a span, right? Whatever emotions that you can put on the emotional wheel is, is, is expressed. But I think that in our world, when you become a parent, there is a pressure to not say any of the bad feelings, right? Any of the challenging feelings. You could say something like, I'm tired. 
right? You can say that like, oh, so it was exhausting or it was hard, but you can't say that. You can't say the word regret. You can't say the word, I'm, I'm holding resentment against this baby, right? Like you can't say like, I'm losing my fucking mind. Like you can't, like you can't, you can't say those mm-hmm. things. And so it's like, as a doula, one of the things that I like create is that space. I'm like, yo, like tell me how you feel. And you know, in a postpartum space as well, usually the, like, the first week to a month that you have the baby, people are like, oh, I'm around. I want to come and bring you food. If you're that lucky, if you're that lucky, right? But then people have to return in their lives. And now you're like, now I feel left behind. And now my my friend's certain like cycle has changed. And like, if they don't have no kids, like they don't have that mindset of like, let's do mom stuff, right? So I think there's a lot of emotions that are experienced, but what creates and inflames, I think, a lot of the mental health conditions is that there's not a lot of spaces to speak all to all of the emotions. And when you're talking about the hormonal changes that are happening, right? Like I had a hysterectomy in January. So even though I didn't get my ovaries out, my estrogen level changed even with the removal of a uterus. And that made more of my ADHD symptoms more obvious to me. Because in the cycle of uh, a person's ovulation and their menstrual cycle, when, you're ob- when your estrogen is lower, usually for women and female body people, your ADHD symptoms will come out more. But then by the time you get to the doctor, you're in a different phase of your menstrual cycle. And now they're like, what? It is, it's not that bad, mm-hmm. right? So imagine being a pregnant person where your estrogen is up, this is up, that up, like everything is moving, but you're trying to keep standard care of your of your baby, of your body, while you're internally experiencing like literal different cycles every hour of the day. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's, it's important that we do have these different identities and we do have these spaces to be whole people because that also helps with our mental health. Mm -hmm. How can you tell when a postpartum emotional cycle might indicate that there's something more serious? What are some key indicators of mental health illness? So I would say for me as a doula, I get a specific insight that most people don't get because when I'm working with the client, I'm learning them prenatally, right? Um, So... We do our visits in the home, right? We do our conversations before the baby gets here. Like we're talking about family cycles. We're getting to know them um, prior to this baby, like, you know, coming earthside. So if that person, for example, if this person tends to be a person that is pretty orderly in their house, right? If I go into the house postpartum and things are a mess and things are kind of everywhere and they're giving me signs of distress, like they're a mess. They don't look like they've had, right? Like that shows me like, okay, we're we're in a totally different space. And there's a difference between like, again, I teach about like, there's baby blues when someone first gets home. Cause it's like, I'm tired. This is baby is here. We're trying to find a place. But after a couple of weeks, if I see that to continue and I start to see more isolation or I start to see um, they're expressing to me more feelings of hardship. There's no joy ever in anything. And also, it's also really, too, another thing about their baby. Like, do they have a baby that is crying all day? Do they have a baby that's generally chill? That's going to be helpful to their mental health, right? Like, so, and also, is their partner helpful? Like, what is their relationship now with the partner? Like, beforehand, we were talking about, oh, my partner's here. They're coming to pre-adults, blah, blah, blah. But then they're telling me now, like, well, they won't do skin to skin. They won't talk. They're trying to stay out the house. Those are all things, right? It's not always just like the person and what they show, but it's like their environment, right? So when I start seeing those shifts, those changes, um, you know, the way that they look, you can tell when someone's not eating. You can tell when someone's not hydrating. You can tell when someone's kind of giving up or they're on their way to giving up. Or sometimes you see that they're overly active, Right, where like you come in the house and they're trying to like clean everything. You're like, what are you? What are you doing? Sit down. What what's happening? Because sometimes that's a way to get away from what's happening in here. It's going to be overly active, right? So it's like those little things. Sometimes it could look different, but like I said, I think that doulas have a different. Our model of care diff- is different. So where a doctor, like I see you in the in the office, someone can present well in the office again. 
But when I go to their house and I'm sitting with them, it's a totally different situation. Mm-hmm. So you get that insight. You get to see the mask on, the mask off. Yes, because you can all, I mean, we've all done it, myself included, as someone who has mental health stuff. Like, you know, I can present well. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about Black women specifically is that we know how to mask. We've learned how to mask. It's been a part of our cultural understanding. It's been a part of our our safety, right? It's like our parents telling us, our grandparents telling us, you're about to be around these white people. Dress this way. Talk this way. Hold your head this way. Don't cry when you go in this grocery store. Don't whatever, right? Like, so we've learned to mask, right? In a way that is like, not just like on oh, masking because I want people to know, but it's like we learn to mask as a survival tactic, mm-hmm. and it can be hard for people to let go of that survival tactic when that's been the way they they know to exist. Yeah, that's inside of the birthing space and outside of the birthing space. A lot of Black women have learned to mask. I mean, obviously, all Black women express themselves mm-hmm. differently but mm-hmm. it when you mention that there are some mothers who will start like doing a lot or just working a lot i think that that is something that many black women can relate to and it's a disassociation right it's like i'm dissociating mm-hmm. right and i think like for me i literally dissociate because of my mental health so i can be totally like not fully knowing what's going on like i can't recall later but someone else will be like you were cleaning and you were doing this and you were doing that and you were you were just I was on autopilot, right? And so like that that survival tactic literally comes from like ancestral, right? Things beyond us, right? If you had to survive being a slave, you weren't about to cry and be upset. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you're about to get and do what you had to do and just dissociate for the rest of the day. Right. So like that's literally something that's been passed down to us. And, you know, people may say like, well, we're not in those kind of conditions, but says who? Right. Like it's someone who is like low income, dealing with already a, a lot of surveillance in their in their area, dealing with a lot of violence in their area. They're still dealing with like a certain level of PTSD, complicated with mental health conditions, and then just sitting in their home. Some people you know, some people like say like, oh, just you need to go outside with your kid. What if you're outside? It's not safe. And people are like, oh, you need your fresh air. What if they, they where? Yeah, what, what grass? What, what <laughs> like, I'm going to go outside and get shot? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm going to go outside and go outside and see drug addict. Like, what What am I, as a doula, I can say that I feel like we, you know, and I'm biased to some degree, but I feel like our, our approach is so, so much more holistic, right? And I'm also a spiritual director, so I'm also like, Let's think about this whole thing, what's going on here, right? Um, Yeah, seeing people as whole beings, especially Black women who often have never been seen as whole beings and don't see themselves as whole beings, is important. Yes to that. As a doula, after you've made that initial awareness and it comes to you, how do you support afterwards emotionally and mentally Mm -hmm. yeah so what i aim to do prenatally is talk about these things before we get to them right so if someone especially if somebody already has a mental health disorder because depending on like they have a mental health disorder and it's being treated by medication they may not be able to take that medication during their pregnancy or they may have to switch to something else right so like I try to have like conversations beforehand of like, okay, who are the people that we would reach out to in our community that would feel like a safe space to get help from? And that could be, I'm very open. So I'm not, it's not always gonna be a therapist. It might be someone that is like a spiritual leader for them. It might be their grandmother. It might be someone who like has filled them up in different ways, right? I think people don't have to be therapists to be therapeutic. Right. So we start in that level because a lot of people are are scared of if I tell a therapist or a doctor, are they going to call a social worker? And now I'm in a CPS system. Um, some people will lean into like, I have a therapist that I talk to. I have a this that I talk to. So like really getting that list together, right, around what that means. But then also having other things around like if, you know, I say like in their, in their setup of support systems, like 
if you're having a really bad day with your depression, who would you like to be a person that comes over? Right? Like who would be someone who can support you through the day? Who who's someone that can like literally do the physical stuff for you, like helping with the baby, or just someone that can make you laugh, right? Like, you know, sometimes you're depressed, but your best friend is like can make you laugh and make you kind of like move into a different space. So kind of setting those things up and then implementing those things when it's time. But also having that conversation of like, these are limits that I have. This is the way the system that I work within. And if we go this far, I am going to have to call in some type of enforcement because now it's all on me and that's not my job, right? I'm not a mental health clinician. I'm not any of that. So just implementing those steps that we talked about prior to and making sure that we have set up like safety people for them. And sometimes the truth is that people don't have safety people, right? So just trying to navigate that as best as possible. Um, but making sure that the kids, because, you know, I think, and I'll just say this one thing, like, the thing that pisses me off is, like, a lot of times when we see things of, like, people that have, like, unfortunately, like, literally murdered their children, um, a lot of those people, especially Black women, have actually sought out help in other ways, but no one was listening. It pisses me off when people are, like, oh, this person had postpartum psychosis, but now it's, like, now this Black person, this Black mother is about to be locked up for the rest of their life, right? Their kids are gone. And then when they look into their history, it's history of them saying, like, I can't handle this. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. I can't whatever. Like, it's too much for me, my mental health. Like, going to physicians, going to, like, people that, like, have some type of whatever. And it's like, I don't think we have enough systems in place for that situation. It comes down to community support and community care as well. And it's like, we just, the systems, you know? Like, where are they? What advice do you have for Black mothers, Black birthing people who want to keep their health intact to protect themselves and their family? So I would say one thing on my mind is like really get clear about who your support system is. And I think that a lot of times people, when you say support system, they're like, oh, I have 20 people because I know 20 people. And I'm like, that doesn't mean you have 20 people of support, right? <laughs> like, that may mean that you have three people out of that 20 that's really ready to jump in and do the things, right? So really getting clear about that. Um, I will also say to set up prior to having a baby, set up systems. If you feel like there's a possibility, or not even if, if there is a possibility, like find a, a therapist now, right? Find a psychiatrist now, find a spiritual care person now and just put it into the face of like, if I shall need, I already have the, the referral. I already have the thing. It's already set up for me to go. Um, Cause like, you know, the way our medical system works is like, when you need it, it's gonna take you 1000 years to get to them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, in between that time and next time, <laughs> like, what could happen in between that time, right? Um, and then the other thing I would say too, especially for, for Black women and Black birthing people is trust yourself. If something doesn't feel right in your body and your mind, I think we have been so gaslit. Like we literally are coming from a system where they were literally writing in books in the 2000s, Black people don't feel pain. Right? Like, so you have to believe yourself. If there's something that does not feel right to you, that's how, that's a lot to do with the maternal mortality rate. Is like people are having postpartum eclampsia, they're having infections, they're having this, they're having that. And they're like, oh, it's not that serious, but it's part of a gaslighting that we do to ourselves because of what the environments that we've been in. So if you see something, feel something, go get checked out. Tell somebody. We have to believe in ourselves and grow that intuition within ourselves. I think that a lot of that has been lost. Um, I know it's fearful. Like, it's like a lot of fear that comes with that. But I think that we know intuitively more than we give our, ourselves credit for. You don't have to be a doctor to be like, yo, something's fucking wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> or like, you don't have to be a doctor to be like, up here, something's not motherfucking clicking, you know? But I think we've been in this kind of hierarchical system. It's like, well, the doctor told me, no, go to another one. 
like when I had my fibroid, I had to go to three doctors in a week for the third doctor, who was a doctor of color, to tell me, you got something going on here. Everybody else was dismissing me. Oh, it's a, it's a this, it's a that. Just go home and take some pain meds. And even if you're in the actual birth space and you feel something or someone's ignoring your stuff, like, fire them. You can fire someone as you're in a process of birth. I don't want to work with this nurse anymore. I don't want to work with this doctor anymore. I'm saying things and I'm not being heard. We we have to learn how to advocate for ourselves. And I know it comes with a lot of fear because we don't want to become, be seen, you know, the, the strong or the angry or the this, but it's literally life or death. And it's like, if I have the shoes to be seen as angry, but I saved my life, I'll be an angry bitch. Mm. Right? And like, get a doula if you can, obviously. Get education, childbirth education. Get, you know, postpartum mental health education. Like, just do things to inform yourself because no one knows you like you and no one's going to protect you like you. Absolutely. To everything that you said, Thank you so much. I mean, I personally resonate with the need to advocate for self as a Black person who gave birth. It is so essential. I mean, I ended up switching from an OB to a midwife, and it was it was very beneficial. <laughs> so, Amen. Thank you so much. Today we heard from Savia Wade, a liberation focused doula, birth worker, and more on the ways birth can impact mental health. Next week, we'll dive into the historical narratives of the mad black woman and how psychology played a role in the development of the colloquialism. Subscribe to get all of the updates. I'm your host, and you've been listening to the Black Bipolar and Disordered podcast. I'll see you next time.